Well, today we continue with our spring sermon series on the supporting characters of the Bible, these small roles in the Bible that have a much larger impact by talking about a woman whose name is mentioned only twice in scriptures, but her story is a powerful one. And so I'll take us first to the book of Numbers, where her name is mentioned. The name of Amram's wife was Jochebed, a descendant of Levi, who was born to the Levites in Egypt. To Amram, she bore Aaron, Moses, and their sister Miriam. And then for the story that Jochebed is known for, we'll go to Exodus and the end of chapter 1. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all of his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, Jochebed, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, She got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it out among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister, Miriam, stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds, and sent her female slave to go get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of those Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister, this is Miriam, asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of those Hebrew women to nurse this baby for you? Yes go, she answered. So the girl went and got Jochebed, the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became Pharaoh's daughter's son. She named him Moses saying, I drew him out of the water. This is the word of God for the people of God. I don't know when it started or exactly how it happened, but somewhere along the line, I've started getting very used to coming in second place. I still have my eighth grade science fair second place ribbon out in our garage. I was the vice president of my church youth group. I rode in the second power seat of my boat of eight people at my crew team at Tufts. I graduated number two in my college class. When Ryan and I did our first daddy-daughters dance at Canyon, We entered the dance-off, we got the second place trophy. And when I used to lifeguard, I was the second fastest swimmer on our patrol, the second best rower on our patrol, and usually the second or third fastest runner. Now what that did mean is any time that we had to send somebody to represent our patrol at a triathlon, I usually got picked because I was good at all of the events. And I'm not sure exactly what to think about that. I, when I was growing up, I was a little bit worried. You know, was this some kind of psychological barrier that I had? Was this some kind of lack of motivation to do what it takes to come in first? And yet, the older I get, the more comfortable I feel with this sort of second place status. 
You know, if we're going to take the work of Charles Darwin at all seriously in his idea of the survival of the fittest, then it's not just something that we were taught. This deep down competitiveness inside of us is something that's hardwired into our DNA, biologically, sociologically, anthropologically, interpersonally. From the time we are young, we are certainly taught to compete in everything, whether it be sports and games, or at school, in our career, in our families, our friendships, even our love lives. Isn't it true? We're taught to, to scrape and claw and jockey for position, trying to garner as much achievement and success on ourselves as possible, to grab as much of the limelight as we can. Here on the west side of Los Angeles, we don't just try to keep up with the Joneses. We need to outdo, outrun, outshine them at every turn. Isn't it true? Leonard Bernstein was once asked, the great Leonard Bernstein, what is the most difficult instrument to play in the entire symphony? And he thought about it for a minute, and then he got this wry smile on his face, and he said, oh, that's easy. Second fiddle. I actually, when I was the associate pastor in Westlake Village, one of our elders, Steve Custer, actually was the second chair cellist for the L.A. Philharmonic. And I used to go to, I used to go and loved watching Steve play the cello in the symphony. And it was so interesting because he very seldom had his name in the lights or his picture in the program. He almost never got to do any kind of solo. But Steve was like the foundation, at least of that side of the symphony. Everybody knew him and everybody loved him. He was always there. He did such a good job. Everyone counted on Steve to bring that sort of texture and richness and depth to the entire orchestra. You know, all of those fancy schmancy first seat soloists, they came and went every year. It seemed like there was a, a different one. But they all counted on Steve to provide the, the harmony and the, and the contrast that made all of those first seats really shine. And not only that, Steve seemed to really love what he did. You know, he just always seemed to be enjoying it, and he was always there in his faithful, unobtrusive kind of way, always there providing the music every night, whatever it was that they were playing. And he also really took advantage of all of the fun things. Like, Steve never missed if the L.A. Philharmonic was playing with uh, Hollywood Bowl and Moody Blues. You know, he would always be the one who was there. Nights in white satin. Da -da 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 -da. Or when the Carnival Cruises would have those L.A. Philharmonic Caribbean cruise theme things. He was always on those things. He always enjoyed the heck out of what he was doing. And during those years watching Steve, I started to feel really comfortable with coming in second place. I started to see a lot of positives and a lot of joy in playing a mean second fiddle. This story, we continue this theme of ours about supporting characters with a woman who probably epitomizes the entire theme more than anybody in the Bible. Again, we only hear Miriam's, or Jochebed's name mentioned twice in the scriptures. Both of them are when they're sort of listing in genealogies, first in Numbers and then in Exodus, where they're saying that she was the wife of Amram and the mother of, of Miriam and Aaron and Moses. But who could ever forget the story? In the story itself, she's not even named, but none of us can forget the story. I don't think any of us can forget Cecil B. DeMille's version of this story in the Ten Commandments.
Abraham. Take my child into thy hands, that he may live to thy service. But mother, we have not even given him a name. God will give him a name. Miriam, watch it from the reeds. See where the Lord will lead him. Yes, Mother. like that. My old professor Tony Campolo tells a story about a time when he was down in Haiti speaking at a mission conference and he had to get back quickly to Philadelphia for something else that he was supposed to be doing and so he was catching a small prop plane from where the conference was to catch a connection in Port-au-Prince to fly on to Puerto Rico and then get an evening flight back to Philadelphia. And as he and the pilot were about to climb onto the plane out on the tarmac Suddenly, this young woman came running, racing out onto the runway with a small little bundle, a blanket in her arms with a newborn baby inside of it. And she ran up to Tony Campolo and she thrust it in his face and said, take my baby. Please, please take my baby with you back to America. And he was so flabbergasted. He said, I, no, I, I can't. I, I couldn't possibly. She said, please, please take my baby. Don't let him starve with me here in Haiti. And Tony Campolo was so freaked out. He was so flustered. He didn't know what to say that he, he just said, come on, let's go to the pilot. And they jumped on the plane and they closed the door in this lady's face and they started pulling away from that spot to take off down the runway. And this woman was running alongside the plane as they were pulling away, saying, please, please, please take my baby. Can you even imagine what it would take, what you would need to push under the surface, to, to sublimate, to forget about, to let go of, in order to even be able to do something like that, even if it was going to save your child's life. As many of you might remember, when the book of Exodus opens, it, there's a new pharaoh. Joseph has died, and there's a new pharaoh who never knew Joseph, and he looks around, and he's starting to get a little worried, because the the Israelites are doing so well. They're, they're multiplying, and they're, there's more and more of them, and so the Pharaoh starts to get worried that they might become so populous that they could rise up in revolt against their Egyptian masters. And so he issues this decree that all of the boys, all of the Hebrew boys that are born need to be thrown in the Nile and drowned. So Jochebed, Moses' mother, gives birth to him, and she wants to save his life, and so she hides him in her own home for the first three months, but that can't go on forever. And so finally she takes him and she puts him in a basket that she's fashioned into a boat, and she pushes it out into the reeds down the Nile River, right near where Pharaoh's childless daughter regularly bathed. And his daughter sees the basket and finds Moses. And then Miriam, Moses' sister, who's sort of tagging along, goes up to her and the woman says, this must be one of those Hebrew babies. And the girl, Miriam, Moses' sister, says, do you want me to go and get one of those Hebrew women to come and wet nurse this baby for you and take care of it? And the, and the Pharaoh's daughter says, yeah, sure. And so guess who Miriam goes and gets? Jochebed. And so she gets to mother and nurse Moses, but she can't ever even let him know that she's his mom. Can you even imagine what that would take? You know, one of the most 
beautiful things that comes when we give our lives to Jesus Christ. When we put Jesus Christ at the center of all that we are and all that we do, when we make Jesus Christ the center of our own universe, is that it gives us this incredible freedom from the competitiveness which is hardwired into our DNA. It gives, them a, it gives us a freedom to not have to constantly outrun and outshine and outdo those around us. I thought I was going to not get all theological on you, but if you can just indulge me for a few minutes. I know that in this day and age, there's a lot of people, a lot of Presbyterians, a lot of people in churches who are really questioning this whole idea of the concept of original sin. For me, it's not a hard concept to understand or believe in. I do believe with all our heart that we all want to be good. We want to be better and better. I think we spend most of our lives wanting and trying to be kinder and more compassionate and generous and patient and forgiving. Yeah, I also don't think it's a stretch to see that we all struggle to, to attain that perfection that we would like to see in ourselves, right? Because I think we all have baggage and issues and things that hold us back and hold us down. And for me, as I get older and I try to understand what this idea is all about, to me, what I see more and more clearly is I think at the very root, at the heart of this whole concept of original sin is one thing. I think it is this sort of original fear and insecurity that we have, that we're not going to make it, that we're not going to have enough or do enough or become enough or be enough. And so from the very beginning, we're thrown onto this treadmill, this rat race to try to, to, try to outdo and outcompete and outshine and to try to garner what we can. I see so clearly that all of the different ways that sin manifests itself in my life, in our lives, in the lives of those around me, in our societies and nation and world, all of the things from from greed and jealousy to warring and, and grappling for power, all of it, arrogance and pride, I see it all stemming out of this original basic fear and insecurity that we have, that we are not enough. And one of the most beautiful things, one of the most beautiful things that comes into our life, when we allow Jesus Christ, when we allow God to come in and love us and take control and speak and whisper God's truths to the depths of our souls, is this trust that God will take care of us. That God will provide, not just the things we need, but you remember when Jesus said, look at the lilies of the field, look at the birds in the air, God clothes them and takes care of them. How much more important are you to God than they are? But it's not just that we'll have enough, it's that we are enough. Because the longer we allow Jesus Christ to be at the center of our lives, the more we start to understand and believe that we really are the dearly loved, beloved, cherished, special, important, precious children of God. And that gives us this priceless gift of being able to finally step down off of that treadmill, of having to to do better than everyone else, having to outshine and outrun and outdo and prove ourselves over and over and over again. God fills those ego needs that are inside of us, and we start to become more confident. And along with that comes this unbelievable gift of finally being able to really see ourselves for who we are, 
to be able to see our real strengths and weaknesses and our gifts and the things that God has called us to and the ways that we can contribute in this world. It is a beautiful thing. And the older I get, the more I start to understand the joy in learning how to play a mean second fiddle of being able to use the gifts that I've been given to try to support people in my life, to try to support situations. And so what does it take to learn this mean second fiddle? Well, the first, hearkening back to our sermon two weeks ago and our sermon on Barnabas and self-esteem, you need to have a good sense of self-esteem and self-awareness. True humility is not thinking less of yourself. True humility is seeing yourself as important, special, beloved, talented creature of God that God has created, but seeing everyone else around you in the exact same way. I was reading a friend of mine who I quote often, Vic Pence, who is the pastor at Peachtree Presbyterian, considered one of the top preachers in our denomination. He was really good friends and had this little preaching rivalry with another friend of mine, Tom Toole, who had been at Memorial Drive and then went on to Fifth Avenue Pres. And Tom was probably considered really the best preacher in our denomination. And Vic said he was always incredibly jealous of Tom. And it was always hard for him to get past it. And so one time when he was introducing Tom at a preaching conference, he got up and he said, you know, I just have to say that Tom Toole is to preaching what Michael Jordan is to baseball. <laughs> I don't know if you remember, Michael Jordan did not do such a good job in his baseball debut. But when we're able to let go of that competitive spirit, when we don't feel like we have to outdo or prove ourselves over and over again, it fills a deep down fear and insecurity in us, and it allows us to be open to who we are and what we do have to share, the gifts that we have to give and how they can be used and God's calling on how to use them in our lives. Sometimes to lead from the front, sometimes to lead from behind, sometimes out in front, sometimes in a supporting role behind somebody or some situation. The second thing I see that happens with those who learn to play a mean second fiddle is they start to develop a really good sense of teamwork. This understanding that my gifts can only take us so far. If we're going to accomplish what God has put us on this earth to accomplish, we need to do that together. I am so proud, and I can't believe, for someone who knows nothing about sports, I'm so proud that we have all of these little touchstones to so many interesting sports situations, so proud that two of our fellow BPCers has, have gone off and built the sports teams that have become world champions in their own sports, right? So we have Bob Myers, who's gone up to, to the Golden State Warriors to become their general manager and has built the team that's become that world championship team. And then we have Jeff Luno, another BPCer, who's moved down to Houston, Texas to become the general managers of the Houston Astros and built that team that's become the current world champions. And when you look at these two people, Bob and Jeff, and you look at the teams that they've built, they have this incredible similarity, which is hard to deny. Because what these two teams have in common is that they're both known as teams that don't necessarily have the very best superstars in each of their sports, but they have two incredible teams that work together unbelievably well. It's almost as if someone has come in and filled those insecurities, filled those ego needs, something or someone, so that they no longer have to hog the limelight. They no longer have to prove themselves over and over again. They can bring their gifts and celebrate those and, and share them with the rest of the team. And together, these teams can do so much more than even LeBron James or, or Clayton Kershaw can do in basketball or baseball. 
And I look at these teams and this sense of teamwork and this sense that they have something going on where they don't need to be out proving anyone anymore. And I wonder, is this, is this just because it's Bob and Jeff? Maybe. <laughs> Is it just because they're Christians and they've had their ego needs met and they believe in themselves and they don't need to prove anything to anyone? Maybe. Is it just because they're from BPC? Maybe. <laughs> when we learn to play a mean second fiddle, it makes us good teammates. And finally, it allows us to let others take the credit. Not just not taking the credit for underlings when they do something and we need to grab the glory from them, but even when we do something together with someone, taking actual joy and allowing them to take the credit. As we increasingly trust that God will give us all the credit that we need, that God will, will make us shine. And the only one that we're trying to please, the only one we're trying to shine in front of is God for God's glory. As we begin to trust that God will take care of us, that God will provide all we need, that through God we not only will have enough, we will be enough. And it changes everything. Who in your life might God be calling you to play this supportive role, to play the second fiddle in their life? What situations in your life might God be asking you to step in in this supporting kind of role? Because in God's eyes, there are no great players and small players. There's just faithfulness. Faithfulness to the gifts that we've been given, to using them to the best of our ability to bring glory to God and God alone. For God, there is no first seed or second seed or 52nd seed. There's just faithfulness and us enjoying and relishing in our most important role as God's precious, dearly loved, and gifted child. And that, by all accounts, is the best seed of all.